So uh, we can start moving forward. Um, Cami, again, thank you so much for taking the time. I know we've all been really excited to hear from you and learn from you um, all the wonderful, wise things you have to tell us. So, <laughs> um, so I, I don't know how you want to start this. Uh, you'll probably want to introduce yourself. I don't, I don't know if the rest of us should, should do introductions as well or how this should work. I'm just going to pass it over to you and follow your lead. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. And I, and I will say I'm always a little worried when someone uses the word wise at the beginning of anything I do. So let's let's hold back our expectations just a little bit because a lot of this depends on all of you as well. And um, but let me start by I've got a presentation for you this evening. Let me pull this up. And I am assuming you can all see the screen. Great. I see some head nods. Yep. Great. Yep. So just I do want to start with some introductions. I wanted to let all of you know a little bit more about myself. My name is Cameron McElhenney, um, and I am Nicole's Director of Training and Education. And, and just we'll, I normally use the acronym NACOL because it's so much easier but that is the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Um, I came to this um, work in 1998. I actually served on a review board myself um, in the city of Indianapolis. Um, I did so for six years. And one of the things that I learned during that time was, well, several things, but one of the main things that leads me here today is that while very well intentioned, I knew very little about civilian oversight of law enforcement. Um, I knew that um, the premise of it, I'd read the ordinance, I had a very little understanding of what was going on in the rest of the country in regards to civilian oversight. And so I knew then that to the extent that I was able, I would work to make sure that others had the information that they needed so you could have that base that helped you to be successful in the work. Um, I was very fortunate that I had one of NACOL's founders of, as my executive director. And so uh, either he saw a willing participant or a sucker. I'm not really sure, but I have been part of NACOL ever since. Um, and became its first full-time employee in 2015. Um, so I'm very glad to bring all of that to you. Um, I still live in Indianapolis. I'm actually joining you from Colorado today, so I'm crossing my fingers as I'm up at a very high altitude that my internet holds for all of you today. But with that, I'd like to take a moment and um, learn a little bit more about all of you. If each of you could take a moment to um, introduce yourself, tell me a little bit about your background um, what, and what you hope to gain from the training modules that we'll be doing now through August 2nd. And then also maybe just a little bit about why you wanted to be a part of, this, of, of the COB. So Lisa, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I'm Lisa Ortiz. I'm an economist by training. Um, I was interested in being part of the COB because I've said this so many times. Um, I believe in the social contract and um, it certainly has felt in the last few years as though it's been uh, strained and you know as a as a, as a citizen of Arlington and a mother, um, I wanted to do something to help to strengthen it. I guess that was really, and I, I just thought this was such an important issue. So that was my reason. Um, and uh, what I'm hoping to get from NACOL is just an understanding of, you know, what kinds of things have worked in the past, what hasn't, you know, we have to draft an MOU still. And so just understanding kind of best practices in general or how we should be thinking about our engagement here. Um, yeah, I mean, what, whatever 
lessons learned or information you have to give us, I think we're very eager to learn it. So that's me. I'll pass it off to Gary. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, nice to meet you, Cami. Uh, thanks for the question. I'm the vice chair assisting Lisa. Uh, so my background, I've lived in the Arlington area on and off since uh, 2005. I was uh, in the military and the Air Force, um, worked at the Pentagon several times, but I retired 2015. I went back to my civilian job. I retired as an airline pilot before COVID. Um, so live in the area, um, have a daughter in school. So, you know, obviously all of us have uh, noticed, you know, the things happening in the country, uh, very emotional um, and, uh, yeah, it's just kind of where things are at, you know, look at Akron right now and all the things going on. And this is a beautiful county. We love living here. I think all of us do. Uh, it's a very unique county uh, in many cases, but I think that my motivation when I saw this uh, opportunity, number one, I you know think all of us want to give to this great community and uh, there's a lot of work involved <laughs> with the cob and giving, but I think we're going to, you know, we're all tracking good and I think we're going to make it there. So obviously training, like anything, is number one. And um, so I'm looking forward to Nicole because, you know, when I applied, I felt like I could bring balance to the board. I mean, I am for the police. You know, I've, I've actually overseen the Air Force's Office of Special Investigations before and and, um, you know, so, but, you know, we all know that, you know, humans, anytime humans are involved, you know, we have, you know, a lot of good things and occasionally some things get out of whack. So, so I just was looking forward to be a part of this um, piece to bring balance to it, but also um, now the training, the way I look at the training right now is it helps give us a framework so that the emotions don't drive a lot of our thinking, you know, like, oh, this is going, this is going on. I think all of us need a baseline, you know, whether you're an ER nurse or whatever, to to really have a framework. And so that's kind of what I'm looking for, just like Lisa, the best practices. What's the framework? Because I know that a lot of uh, data and um, smart people, <laughs> smarter than us, have put this together. So thank you, and I look forward to the training. Thanks, Gary. Um, Dave, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, um, my name is David Smith and um, I'm an attorney. Um, I've been a prosecutor. I was a, an assistant U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia for 10 years um, and I worked at in private practice for a little while and then I came back to the Department of Justice and I've been back at the Department of Justice in a non-litigating policy role for 15 plus years. So most of my career I've been with the Department of Justice and have worked with law enforcement um, for many years. Um, and so I have an understanding of the investigatory process um, and I have had occasions to be, to work very closely with law enforcement and have trusted them, um, but have also seen instances where they were wrong and, um, you know, uh, as part of the sort of work that I've done more recently with the Department of Justice, I've become interested in sort of the systemic issues that uh, exist in society. And I've been a resident of Arlington since 90, actually since 95 or, yeah, since 95. Um, and have, um, had two kids grown up here and am interested in participating more deeply in, in the issues in the community because like Gary said, I'm really interested in supporting the community. I think Arlington is a great place. I think the Arlington Police Force is, a, is an excellent police force. Um, there's always going to be things that can be done better. One of the things I'm interested in is not only the individual um, um, complaints that we will uh, review in con connection with complaints of misconduct by the police, but also the larger policy questions as to ideas that we can suggest to the police to better address um, 
issues as we learn of them in the community. So um, um, that's why I'm interested in the, in the board. And in terms of the training, you know, I don't have a great deal of experience in terms of civilian oversight. Um, I'm interested to learn what other jurisdictions do. Um, and as Lisa and Gary said, to get a framework for how to approach it. And so just uh, very excited to be part of this um, and uh, looking forward to the training. Thanks, David. Uh, so before I pass it off to somebody else, um, I thought of something else I wanted to mention, which is that we have an, an unusually high number of data nerds on this uh, on this uh, cob, and uh, we're 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 really thinking a lot about data and what sorts of data we could collect and what sorts of data are being collected and how people are looking at data. Since you since you asked what we'd be interested in, I know that a lot of us are interested in data and how data are collected and what's collected and where we can find it and how to use it. So I'll throw that one out there as well. Um, so I'll pass it off to uh, Martine. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, what's going on? <laughs> uh, you're introducing yourself and explaining why you're interested in working on the COB and also what, what you would like to get out of the training from NACOL. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Martin, uh, and I am, um, well, what I'm looking to get out of this is um, a partially to be well informed not and to look at things that are on a factual basis rather than an emotional one. Um, and I think what I'm also looking for is to um, hear from the experts and the people that have created, um, uh, sorry. Oh, Martin, you muted yourself. Unless we lost you. OK, I think I might have lost him. Um, we can come back to him. Uh, Julie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for your time today. I work in transportation engineering by day, um, but I also mm -hmm. work with foster kids in the Arlington and Alexandria area as a court appointed special advocate. And so in the last seven years in that role, I've had a lot of different interactions with the police um, uh, in very different capacities, um, but also with folks who have a lot of mistrust for police, sometimes, you know, more and less um, justified. But I guess my interest in the COB generally is that I think that it is while programs like this often draw a lot of criticism for being, you know, unnecessary in a place like this, I think um, being proactive is always less expensive than dealing with large problems. And the sort of purview of law enforcement is responsive to um, the local identity. And in Arlington, you know, our regional identity within the county is very different. Um, but it also is changing, and I think that's a great opportunity to be proactive about um, making sure that we're not just adopting national best practices. And I heard Chief Penn, you know, say this himself, but tailoring our police activity to respond to the desire of the community for, um, you know, public safety in in different mechanisms. So um, I've really enjoyed reading a lot of Nicole's uh, Nicole's reports. Um, I got very interested in um, sort of law enforcement reform after the DOJ released their report after Michael Ferguson was killed in 2015 and just seeing how, you know, sort of um, extended the relationships can be between, you know, I think the number one finding in that report was that it was revenue generating, you know, pressure on police uh, departments can erode the focus on public safety within a department. And so that's something that municipal um, agencies can be more proactive about. So um, as everyone else has said, still very much in the learning phase. I'm definitely curious about how we can use data to 
um, be more effective and also how to acknowledge and identify some of the limitations or gaps in data because I think sometimes we think that it's objective, but you know, it's it's very useful usually as indicators, um, but you know, data never really tells the whole story. So getting to know how we can use that without over relying on it. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful for your time today. Thanks, Julie. Um, Anika? Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get myself together. No worries. Okay. So we're just doing a basic introduction, right? Yeah, just um, sort of your background, your interest in the COB and what you're hoping to get out of the NACOL training. Thanks. Okay. Well, I am, I, I'm actually former military, so I was in the Air Force, and after that I attended ASU and received my degree in uh, social work. I have my master's in social work. Right now I'm doing the uh, micro uh, therapy. I do have an interest in going into macro and actually working with uh, uh, elected officials and with policy and policy, excuse me. Um, my interest in the COB, just the, the current state that we're, we're in and just feeling uh, like the, I don't have a voice and, 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 I, and I know I do. As, as a therapist, you definitely got to have a voice. So I know I have a voice. I know I have opinions. I know I have suggestions. I know I have, um, I, I want to be part of putting a solution together and making sure that it's fair and balanced. Um, so when I saw that the county was, uh, you know, announced the COB, I thought, okay, why not? Let's see, let's take a chance. And to my surprise, they said, yes, please join. We need that perspective because um, we all know there's a lot that comes with dealing with the public. If you serve in uh, public uh, services, you know that it's it's not for the uh, lighthearted. It, it, it's a lot. It takes a lot for you to uh, work with the public and make sure you're doing a, a good job. And um, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, long day, so I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember everything that I had in my mind when I was going to get up here and say, so <laughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, I'm new, no, no, I'm not new to Arlington. I've been here for about five years now. And this is one of, you know, the places out of the whole DMV area that I feel is like it's it's a, a, a small city in a big you know, it has that small town feel, but it's in that big metropolitan area. And that's what really drew me here when I decided to come back to the uh, East Coast. So I want to make sure that I contribute as much as I can uh, from the perspective of a social worker. Like this, this doing this, the COB, participating in the COB allows me to tap into my macro. Um, and that's what I really want to do. And I, you know, I enjoy doing it on a volunteer basis. So that's the main reason why, just making sure that everyone has a representation and everything is fair and balanced on both sides. Thank you for that, Anika. No problem. Thank you. Um, Sasha? Hey, good evening, Cameron. My name is Sasha and thanks for doing this training. I'm a 20 year uh, policy wonk at the Department of State, the Department of Defense, and now the Department of Homeland Security, where I work primarily on immigration and asylum issues. But throughout my career, um, I've really been focused on human rights and promoting accountability in the military and police space in foreign countries, including Sudan, South Sudan, Mexico, um, and uh, helping to do training on human rights and like real, real basic, um, real bit basic fundamental stuff with um, countries with police forces and militaries that would benefit from some additional support. So um, that's my background. Um, why am I here on this board? I'm here on the board because I love Arlington. It's my community. I raised my family here. Um, I've seen bad policing, like where somebody hits a two-year-old on a median and then bribes the police $20 and nothing ever happens. So I've seen really bad policing. Um, 
and I've seen great policing and I'm really um, committed to making sure that the Arlington County Police Department is a department that works for all Arlingtonians. And um, yeah, so I just, I'm just, I saw this as an opportunity to make sure that the police force was uh, an entity that worked for everybody and I wanted to be a part of it and thrilled to be a part of it. And um, what do I have to get out of this training? Just honestly, uh, to get smarter on the topics, uh, to see best practices. I really believe in not reinventing the wheel where we don't have to. So I like listening to people who are smarter than me, which is, you know, mostly everybody in this space and uh, learning from them to see um, what, what, what we can adapt and, and what we can take on as our own. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sasha. So I think that's everyone. Lisa? That's yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, our two non-voting members are, I think they're both traveling, so they're not here. So, yep, that's us. Okay. Lisa, Perfect. Gary, no. can I have one short, very short alibi? So, sure. I'm going to back to the comment. I can remember who made it um, regarding, you know, getting involved. And so, just a background, Cam uh, Cameron. Um, and we all are, we're on board, we're all taking our training, but most of our training has been receive mode um, with some interaction. The last training was good. So I know you've got this, you're gonna do your style, but anywhere possible, we can start uh, hearing some of our other teammates. Um, I know the county picked an outstanding team, but uh, you know, the format, hasn't allowed us to collaborate very much. So I don't know, you're going to do this your way. Hey, we're all here. <laughs> we're behind you. Looking forward to this, but any chances we can um, where these sessions like this, we're not bounded by these other rules of getting together. We're here now, all of us, <laughs> except for the two non-voting. But anyway, just wanted to share that quick and uh, I don't want to belabor that, but uh, just wanted to, we are, we are all kind of gelling, you know, trying to gel and mm -hmm. uh, Anything we can do that will be very beneficial. Thank you. No, thank you for saying that, Gary. I appreciate it. Um, the importance of you interacting and becoming um, a cohesive entity is really important. And when I use the word cohesive, that doesn't mean you're going to agree all the time, um, that you're going to always be a united front. Um, but being able to know each other and how you'll work together is is incredibly important. So as we kind of move along, not only will I take time now to talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today, um, um, which is we're going to talk about, a, we're going to have a basic overview of civilian oversight of law enforcement. We're going to talk a little bit about definitions, history, what kind of models we see across the United States so you have a better understanding of civilian oversight of a, as a whole. We're also going to talk about the 13 principles for civilian or principles for effective civilian oversight of law enforcement. Um, and I, I know, Julie, you mentioned reading some of our stuff, so some of you may be familiar with some of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, but to your point, Gary, I also want to say that our next module that we will be doing, um, it, it will be, um, we'll be talking about uh, effective practices in investigations, both con the conducting and reviewing of investigations. And there will be um, a case provided to all of you ahead of time. Um, so there will be quite a bit of interaction there. Um, I have, um, I personally, like to have questions as we go. Um, you know, when someone talks to you for three hours, at some point you'd like to probably interject a question or two, and I don't want to wait till the moment has passed um, for that to happen. So please feel free. Um, I can't see all of you while I have my screen showing. So if there is a question, um, feel free to jump in. And our last module that we will be doing um, Oh, well, back to the second module, we'll also be talking um, about effective reporting practices. I know that there is a lot of um, uh, reference to the types of reports that you as an entity will be providing to the public, as well as the county board. Um, and we'll go over that. And then also, um, I, I do love a good group of, of, of data nerds. Um, and so I want to make sure that we um, take some time to talk about that with all of you, and we'll be inviting some people in who actually do work with the data um, as they as a pr practitioner of civilian oversight. 
um, so that we can have a little bit of time for you to better understand um, really the, the good and the bad of data. Um, what kind of data is useful? How data can sometimes, even though data seems very objective, can sometimes um, fall into the realm of sub subjectivity. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then our last module will um, is always one of my um, favorite uh, modules because we'll be talking not only about um, we'll give a lot of opportunity for all of you to speak on opportunities and challenges that are coming your way as you do this work. Um, but we'll also be talking about the management of expectations, manage management of your own expectations of the process, but also managing expectations of stakeholders across the board, um, whether that's your elected officials, your community members, law enforcement, um, everybody comes to this with certain expectations, um, but uh, managing them is really one of uh, becomes a main fo focus of a civil oversight entity. Um, and so we'll talk about that too. And a lot of that will build upon the, the basics that we're starting with tonight. So with that, I'm going to jump right in to the meat of what we actually are are here for this evening. So let's start with civilian, the definition of civilian oversight of law enforcement. So there are Civilian oversight is different things in different jurisdictions, but overall it is an entity that investigates audits or reviews internal law enforcement investigations or processes um, that can include community complaints or looking at use of force incidents, but it also can be um, an, a mechanism that conducts ongoing monitoring or auditing of law enforcement agencies, policies, procedures, training, um, supervision and management practices. Um, and I will, I like to highlight the supervision and management practices because a lot of times um, people focus on policies and procedures. And I, I think all of you can understand how important um, policies and procedures are, but how they are implemented and how the supervision of people who are following those policies and procedures, how important that really is. And one of the very important aspects of civilian oversight is that it's an agency or process that that involves active participation of all of the things I just mentioned by people who are not currently sworn law enforcement. And I stick that word currently in there. Every jurisdiction has a, a something surrounding how they do or do not involve law enforcement in the process. So, for instance, you have two um, former law enforcement who are non-voting. You, there are some um, agencies, Indianapolis is an example of it, where they have two sworn law enforcement who are part of their board who are non-voting. There are agencies who do investigations, who have former law enforcement who do them, and then there are agencies out there who exclude all former law enforcement regardless of any part of their process. So it really runs the gambit. There are um, jurisdictions who have um, some involvement and some who have none, but one of the things to remember is that the active participation in the in the process of civilian oversight does not include sworn law enforcement, current sworn law enforcement. So civilian oversight, and, and we'll get into this even more when we talk a little bit more about the history of civilian oversight. Civilian oversight traditionally um, had been a very reactive process. Normally, agencies are created after a high-profile incident. Um, you, you respond to individual complaints, um, sometimes only review policies because of the complaints that are coming in. It emphasizes legalistic rules, can sometimes be seen as adversarial, recommends sanctions, and relies on deterrence. 
Now, as I get to the next slide, when we talk about oversight evolving into a more proactive role, it's important to remember that there will always be a reactive piece of civilian oversight. There will always need to be that piece that reacts to specific allegations of misconduct or problems that are that they see with um, specific policies or training practices. But we have um, since the, the mid 90s have seen this movement towards more proactive elements within civilian oversight. I know one of you had talked about looking talked about the systemic issues, um, not only in society, but I'm going to take that into law enforcement. There are some systemic issues, but the proactive elements of, of civilian oversight looks at problems through investigation, collection, analysis of data to see where the problems exist so that they can try to make recommendations for improvements in policies and procedures as well as training before incidents of misconduct occur. It looks at organizational change rather than dealing with the misconduct of one officer. Um, it looks at reduction and prevention of misconduct. And one of the things that I think long term really helps is it builds part. It looks at building partnerships with law enforcement, creating those bridges between law enforcement and the greater community. One of the things that civilian oversight is really good at and is and is a really important element of its overall success is I honestly believe that there is not another element out there that is better positioned to build that bridge between law enforcement and the greater community. Um, it's community members, and I'll say this phrase quite often, it's community members who come into a process who are not necessarily working for the police or for community, but they're there to work for the process. Um, and so uh, as, as we talk about things like procedural justice and legitimacy, that becomes a really important element of civilian oversight is its ability to be there for the process and build the partnerships and create bridges that then end up really affecting the way that civilian or that civilians and law enforcement interact with one another. So a few facts about the field. So there are currently over about 220 active civilian oversight entities across the United States. I think that um, that seems like a fairly small number when we consider that there are approximately 18,000 law enforcement agencies. Um, but I want to I like to put that number in context just a little so that we can kind of not make it seem like such a huge gap between oversight and number of law enforcement agencies. So there are about approximately 750 to 765 um, sworn members of law enforcement across the United States. Um, about 60% of those are police officers. Um, the other 40% fall into categories such as sheriffs, school resource officers. Um, but what's interesting is that over half of all agencies have 10 or fewer full-time officers. So you're talking about very small departments. And while we are seeing oversight being implemented in some of those very small um, uh, agencies, a lot of times there are issues such as budget, um, a lack of uh, of that core group that sees the necessity for it, unfortunately, is sometimes the issue. And also, and I actually have this conversation with uh, jurisdiction today, there's often the problem in the small communities of the potential for conflict of interest. Um, the smaller the community, the more likely that you just need a few data points, even if they're supposedly anonymous, and all of a sudden you probably know that might be Joe Smith from over on Elm Street um, who filed this complaint, whereas otherwise um, in a bigger city it might be anonymous. So there are some issues there. 
Um, it's also remember if we're talking about this contextually, about two thirds of sworn officers of that 760 plus thousand officers, two thirds of them work in agencies that have 100 or more officers. And if we want to break that down even further, 7% of the largest state and local law enforcement agencies employ those two thirds of sworn law enforcement. So we have most of law enforcement working in 7% of, of law enforcement agencies. Um, a little bit more about that number, the 220 active civilian oversight entities. So when we were entering into the year 2020, we had approximately 200 civilian oversight entities. And since that time, just our organization alone, and I know we're not the only one that people are speaking with, but we've been working with 150 different jurisdictions who are looking to implement and sometimes in, enhance existing, but mostly just to implement civilian oversight entities. So the possibility that in the next couple of years that uh, that number of 220 could be much, much higher is very likely. One of the other things that we consider when we're talking about civilian oversight is that no two entities are exactly alike. And we'll get into this piece a little bit more because it's very important when we talk about effective practices and the models of civilian oversight exist, that when you look at two agencies that may look fairly similar on the surface, really there are not two that are completely identical. Um, we also see that most large cities, I, we finally have the top 10 all with civilian oversight. Um, and lar most large law enforcement agencies have oversight. Um, we are seeing a growing number of small and mid-sized jurisdictions implementing um, civilian oversight. I think in the past year, the smallest city that we've worked with had 14,000 people. Um, and But we also work with cities like Phoenix um, and Los Angeles and Chicago. And um, so we see the smallest and the biggest and everything in between. Um, something else that I think is an interesting fact about the field is that when I first entered civilian oversight, um, we were kind of just working here in our own little jurisdictions. Um, but as, uh, as we were um, entering into the 2000s, we started seeing that civilian oversight was featured more prominently in Department of Justice settlement agreements. And so it's become, um, I think that that's also helped the growth um, of civilian oversight and its ability to really settle in, um, hopefully to what will eventually be what is considered a permanent part of any uh, public safety structure. So why is oversight necessary? Did I hear a question? Cammie, yes. Yeah, be, uh, be, Cammie, before Cammie, you get off the slide. Um, so the 220, you know, this initial, um, you know, growth, just mm -hmm. in general, was most of that 220, um, and I don't want you to you know, over characterize it, but is, would you, in your estimate, was, was most of that proactive, or reactive in the early stages in this growth to 220? In the early stages, I would say the majority of it was um, reactive. Um, most cities uh, that have oversight that was formed before, say, 2010, um, maybe even 2015, they all have an origin story. Um, you know, like for instance, in Ferguson, it's Michael Brown. In Indianapolis, it's Michael Taylor. Um, in uh, the Bay Area and the BART um, Police Department, it's it's Oscar Grant. So it was very reactive to start, and it slowly, um, we've seen jurisdictions say, before we have an origin story, we know we have issues, we can always be better. Let's proactively implement something so that we can be the best that we can be. 
we are seeing that more often. Um, but when I say that, I feel like I always need to have a, a small qualification um, there that a lot of times an origin story happens to be the one that ends up on TV or in the newspaper or on someone's cell phone. Um, but one of the reasons to proactively implement um, oversight, even when there isn't community outrage over a specific incident, is because there's always that, that piece where relationships between community and the police that serve them could be improved. So Thank I'm sure you. I over answered your question, Gary, but I hope that helps. <laughs> Thanks. So why is oversight necessary? So uh, I go through these lists because I think it's really important to have these at the top of, of our thought process when we're doing the work of civilian oversight, but I know that these are probably very well known to everyone here. But, you know, oversight is a mechanism that helps protect human rights. It helps promote constitutional policing, of course, increasing public confidence and trust. As I mentioned before, building that bridge between law enforcement and, and the communities that they serve. It helps to support effective policing. So earlier, um, I think it was you, Sasha, that mentioned you've seen good policing and you've seen bad policing. And so what Oversight wants to do is lift the good policing up and make sure that it supports officers who are part of good policing by making sure that those who engage in misconduct are held accountable. Um, it also, if we're looking at the proactive element, it also supports effective policing by making sure the policies and procedures, as well as the training that officers are receiving, is the best that it can be. It also ensures greater accountability and whatever his city and, and county wants to hear is it also enhances risk management. Can a quick question? Uh, will we have a copy of this PowerPoint? set of slides? Absolutely. OK, great. Thank you. Actually, David was already, um, uh, Graham already sent it out. So if you look at your county, uh, oh, actually, Mummy did. So if you look at your ca county uh, email account, it's already there. Sorry. Sorry, thanks. Oh, sure. great. OK. Um, well, and that's a good point, David. Also, as we're talking, if there are some other things that I mentioned that you might um, appreciate some additional resources behind. Also, please let me know. I'm happy to um, provide you any kind of resource material that also would further um, your goals here for this training. So just let me know. So common goals of oversight. So you want to make sure that the process is accessible to everyone and that there are no barriers to filing of complaints. It's, Im it's important to remember that not everyone feels comfortable stepping forward to say that the police did something wrong. Um, and that there are a thousand different reasons for that. That could have that could be um, their their perception of policing. It could be because of a very specific event that happened to them. It could be because their community feels it that they don't want to come forward because then it exposes them to possible other issues. Um, so it's important to really think about how can you reach every member of your community, no matter what part, where they're living, their feelings about the process, how can you make it a comfortable and accessible process to all of them? You want to make sure that investigations are fair and thorough and that the the findings are reasonable and discipline is appropriate. And I have to tell you, this is a common goal of oversight that not only benefits community, but this there are many pieces in here that also benefit the law enforcement agency. This bullet point is absolutely one of those. Um, and actually, so is the next one to improve public confidence in the police. If you have a, po a community that has more confidence in the police, they're much more willing to work with them. 
um, which not only makes um, it easier um, to work cases and close cases, it also makes it um, a safer environment for them to be working in. An additional goal is to enhance the transparency of organizations by making sure that um, information is available publicly um, and that officers who can, are found are to have con, um, engaged in misconduct are held accountable. Um, that again, also a benefit for law enforcement as well. Some additional um, goals. Of can I make a quick comment? Sorry, yeah. I don't. I don't. Go ahead. Don't mean, don't mean to keep interrupting you, but I mean I can just confirm that um, there is some inherent reluctance to make complaints for some folks, um, and actually myself included. I mean I think I've mentioned this to some folks, but some years ago a member of my family was arrested, um, and the, the 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 situation worked out probably as it should have, but. As part of the process, I am 100% sure that the officer lied under oath about something, and I was really angry. I mean, I've worked with law enforcement for my whole career, and and I didn't file a complaint. Um, I probably should have, but um, you know. So it just at the end of the day, I thought, well, it's over. You know, the thing worked out the way it was supposed to. No harm, no foul. But honestly, I think it's like when a waiter gives you bad service, you should tell that to somebody because the process is improved, like what you're saying. So I just thought I would support that point with my own personal experience, even as someone who's worked with law enforcement my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. And and when this this thing happened, I was like, that's outrageous. I, I, I was so angry, but I actually didn't do anything about it. So just, uh, just an, an additional point to make. No, it's a great point, David, and we'll actually talk a little bit more about that too when we start talking about the principles of oversight and community involvement and, and outreach. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Um, so some additional um, uh, common goals, improving po policies, practices, and training, as well as that supervision and management that we talked about earlier. Um, we always hope that oversight has a level of deterrence um, uh, so that officers won't engage in misconduct and that um, it can also produce an effect, more effective and consistent, not only investigation, but disciplinary process. I think a lot of officers will um, tell you that there is often um, issues, whether it's perception or reality, of inconsistencies and biases in, in the disciplinary process. And so civilian oversight um, can help with that. Um, particularly in a model like yourself, where not only are you able to make discipline recommendations, but you also have that auditing component to this, where um, the disciplinary process can occasionally go under um, an audit to make sure that it is being um, implemented in a fair and consistent manner. Um, reducing legal liability. Um, cities and counties pay out a lot of, of money every year um, for officer misconduct or for the insurance policies that pay out those, those uh, um, settlements. And then also something very important is it improves the public understanding of of policing in their community, whether that's the policies that guide policing practices, whether it's the training that each um, uh, recruit receives and the, the ongoing training that they receive, um, and also uh, the practices and supervision um, that go on in law enforcement agencies. There are some very serious misconduct issues that occur in law enforcement, but there are also issues that stem from a misunderstanding um, of what police policy and, and procedure actually looks like. Um, and so the, your ability to educate the community on some of those things will be very key. Okay, so next we're gonna go into the history of civilian oversight. <laughs> want to before you go on to the next phase I just want to comment on that um, 
The um, and I'm looking forward to our engagement with uh, more with Chief uh, Penn in this area. But one of the things, the beauty of coming in proactive right now is generally when I see things reactive, when you get to deterrence or, or the, the deterrence effect of oversight can actually move the pendulum in the direction where officers don't react um, for fear of uh, what could happen. So I, it's, I, I'm so, I mean, we're blessed that we, we are on this, on this side of things where we can uh, come on in, our county's being proactive, but I have seen on the reactive side, it having a negative effect where a citizen safety, um, maybe there was action that could have resulted in saving a life or doing things, but you gotta be, that's that balance thing. There's no exact science to this. But um, I look forward to having those type of conversations and how do you have oversight, all these different aspects of what we're aiming to support. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, we want open all these buzzwords, but we all of us hope that at the end of the day that the police officer is being effective at uh, doing what the citizens uh, expect them to do. Thanks for that, Gary. And so it, um, I will make a mental note to make sure to to emphasize when we get to the community um, and stakeholder engagement. Um, I think it's important to note that the education piece um, goes both ways. So it's not only educating the community on policing practices, but it's also educating police on um, civilian oversight practices and the disciplinary process and um, having and, and we'll talk about a few um, ways that I've seen communities work on that so that there's a better understanding all around. So the 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 perceptions people might have that might cause them to act in a certain way, um, although perceptions are what they are, and sometimes it's hard to um, completely weed those out. Um, but limit them to the point where people can act in the most effective way possible. So thanks for bringing that up, Gary. Yeah, and, and what made me think about that is what we're hearing about uh, Uvalde, Texas, where the latest report was this guy had the ability to do it, but oh, I need to make sure I have approval. So, you know, hey, we're not Monday night quarterbacking people. It's just an interesting concept as we move forward. I look forward to discussing with, with my team here these type of topics. Great. Great. So if there are not any more comments or questions right now, we'll move into the history of civilian oversight. Great. So I'm I'm going to give a very, it may not seem that way to you, but <laughs> I'm going to give a very brief history of civilian oversight to you. But I will say that the report that NACO released uh, last year. It can be found on our website. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's under the resources tab under recent reports. In the main report, there is a very extensive section on the history of civilian oversight and talks a, a little bit more about um, what happened in each era. Um, but for our purposes for today and with time limitations, I'm just going to give you a brief history, but do know there's more information out there if 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 you desire it. Um, so first of all, there have there were probably plenty of attempts at civilian oversight, but the real first um, uh, experiment in oversight that we have on record um, to any great extent is from 1928 when the Committee on Constitutional Rights was formed in Los Angeles by the Los Angeles Bar Association. Um, now, the uh, Bar Association just took it upon themselves to form this committee. It had no authority. It had no enabling legislation. So as you can imagine, it was not particularly effective. They had little to no access to any information, um, but there at least was the thought about reviewing misconduct investigations and following through to see if investigations were occurring. The next um, thing I want to point out is just a few years later, um, we have the Wickersham 
Commission, who recommended, um, even though their their original work was to look into the effects of prohibition, um, what they really ended up doing was bringing to light a lot of corruption um, and unacceptable tactics by law enforcement. And as a result, they recommended that a disinterested agency needed to be put in place to combat lawlessness in law enforcement. So that was really the first time we see an official body recommend something, although not quite in name, um, but something in, uh, like civilian oversight of law enforcement. However, even though that happened in 1931, we do not see the first um, official civilian oversight board formed until 1948, and that was actually in Washington, D.C. Um, really, I have to be honest, the only reason that this is a, an important um, point is because it was the first. Um, they were deemed incredibly ineffective. Uh, in I, Between the years of 1948 and 1964, they only reviewed 54 cases. And I, I, although I never base effectiveness on the number of cases reviewed or the number of sustained cases, one has to imagine that um, there probably were more points where complaints should have been filed or could have been filed or more investigations done. That's just not very many investigations for a city like the District of Columbia in that stretch of time. In 1953, um, we see, and as you can see, things are happening fairly slowly here. So the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board was formed. So this is just the first iteration of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, which I'll refer to as the CCRB. This first iteration only had three commissioners and it operated completely internally to the department. It uh, about 1966, it was um, expanded to include um, more citizens or to include citizens at all. However, it was almost immediately abolished um, through voter referendum and an incredibly effective um, campaign by the, the police union. So that lasted about 13 years and then it was abolished through the voter referendum. In 1958, we see the Police Advisory Commission uh, or board established in Philadelphia. Um, it only lasted until uh, 1967 when a, a judge um, ruled that it was illegal. Um, so they abolished it. Um, but it's important that this is the when we start to see what we eventually see in more modern day um, civilian oversight entities. It was a group of civilians who referred complaints to be investigated. Um, I will say Philadelphia is the one of the most resilient oversight cities in the country. Uh, it was reestablished in 1994. Um, and it was considered one of uh, a very strong mechanism. You're, you're, you're breaking up. I, I can't hear anything anymore. I don't know if others can. No, I can't either. Um, she might have to reconnect. Um, can you hear me? Ah, now, now we can. Yep. Okay. Can you still see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. We missed okay, about so, five to a minute. We missed the last minute. Okay. So I was talking about Philadelphia, and it's one of the most resilient oversight agencies I think that we have. Um, after abolishment, they were uh, reinstituted in 1994. And I will say in the last five to six years, I they have reinvented themselves I, at least two times. Um, so I think it's important to note that civilian oversight 
once established, there's also that need to reassess authorities and look at how it can be improved, just like you're looking at law enforcement and how it can be improved. Let's see if I can. OK, so. <clears throat> So next, I want to move on to um, the next phase of the history of civilian oversight. So in 1969, the Kansas City, Missouri Office of Citizen Complaints was established. This is really only important because this is the longest continually running um, civilian oversight entity in the country. Um, they once they were established, um, they have occasionally worked on authorities, but for the most part, they've stayed consistent to their mandate since 1969. In 1973, I would like to say that this is where we really start to pick up speed in the civilian oversight growth. Um, we, in 1973, the Police Review Committee was established in Berkeley. California by voter referendum, and it is the very first civilian oversight that has independent investigatory authority. So both of, both of those things are very important. We're not only seeing that independent investigation piece, but we're also seeing community members vote oversight into existence. Um, the Board of Police Commissioners in Detroit was also established later this year and also had independent investigation um, investigators uh, within its agency. By 1980, we had a whopping 13 uh, civilian oversight agencies in operation. And I think this is a good moment to note that when I'm talking about civilian oversight agencies, I'm talking about those that have some form of enabling legislation. There are quite a few quote unquote oversight entities out there that are really advisory boards. They have no enabling legislation. Um, I actually served one, on one in Indianapolis uh, with the sheriff's uh, department for a, a short period of time where essentially they are, they meet with law, law enforcement, they talk about issues in the community, but there isn't any real oversight or any authority built into it. So when I'm talking about these 13 civilian oversight agencies, these are 13 oversight agencies that were enabled by legislation in their communities. 20 years later, we have more than 2,000, or more than 100 oversight agencies in operation. And then um, I do think, let me back up just a minute uh, after 1980. Um, in 1993, and I think this is important because of the type of civilian oversight entity you have, because you have that auditor piece to it. I just want to mention that um, in 1993, it was a huge year for civilian oversight. Not only was the CCRB in New York City revived, but we see the independent police auditor start to take hold. Um, between 1993 and, and 1998, um, we see several agencies um, or several several jurisdictions across the country start to implement the auditor model, um, which I'll talk about the specifics of um, what an auditor model is later. But um, we start to see that because it's uh, people are starting to look at how can we not only have that reactive piece of civilian oversight, but how can we have a proactive piece as well? Um, not only was uh, WC, the independent police auditor established in San Jose, um, shortly thereafter, also in Tucson, Arizona, Seattle established a police auditor. Um, there was a special counsel to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department um, with the power to investigate um, deputies. Um, and their operation. And shortly thereafter, Los Angeles Police Department also established the Office of the Inspector General, which also falls into that auditor monitor um, model. Um, and now, as I mentioned before, by 2020, there are approximately 200 civilian oversight agencies in operation. Um, and, and I use the term approximately because we're learning about new ones all the time. Um, even uh, last week, I heard about a jurisdiction that I had no idea they had established oversight. Um, so we're constantly learning about um, those uh, communities that have been are doing the work. OK, before we move on to the next section, any questions? 
Great. So now we're going to talk a little bit um, about the models of oversight, but I always like to talk about legitimacy and authority a little bit before we move into the specifics of the different ty types of models that exist. Um, so what shapes legitimacy? Um, so what shapes a community's views about legit the legitimacy of policing um, practices? is really whether the police are exercising their their authority in fair ways. Um, so that sounds a lot like the foundation. The foundations are four pillars of, of procedural justice, neutrality, respect, voice in the process and, and trust. Um, when we apply this to policing, <clears throat> we look at the quality of decision making. Are decisions by police being made in a fair, neutral, and unbiased way? We also look at the quality of treatment. Are people being treated fairly, respectfully, and in a courteous way? Um, the application of procedural justice really in this context is about people being treated in a respectful and unbiased way where they're given a voice and can trust the motives motives and when all of that is in place it often becomes more important to people than the actual legal outcomes um so i think that this is really important when we talk about the principles of civilian oversight we're going to talk a, a lot more in depth about procedural justice um, it's one of the important principles um, but i do like to talk about it also as it relates to what shapes legitimacy for um, law enforcement. And eventually we'll talk also how it shapes the legitimacy of civilian oversight. So I also wanna talk a little bit about the types of authority. So you have statutory authority, which is you know, local ordinances, state and federal laws. And it's based upon being somewhat reactive, authority driven, problem driven. Um, it measures a whole lot of numbers and results. Um, and it's about loss, lawful use of authority. But there's also legitimacy based authority, which really centers more around community expectations and values as opposed to statutes or enabling legislation. The foundation of this type of authority is based much more on willing compliance, proactive approaches, um, that outreach and engagement that keeps coming up in the conversation, and also more about measuring success as opposed to just numbers and results. Um, so I think sometimes I've heard people describe this as more, sometimes can be more subjective as opposed to objective. Um, it also is about changing conditions to lessen the, the incidence of misconduct. Um, before I move on to the structures, I wanna say one more thing about authority or a couple more things. Um, so when we're talking about legitimacy in policing, we're talking about the belief that police are trustworthy, they're honest, and that they're concerned about the well-being of those that they come in contact with. It's also the belief that police authority ought to be accepted. If you believe that they're legitimate, then you believe that you, you voluntary ex voluntarily accept their decisions and follow their directives. And you feel that you should comply and cooperate. If we apply that to legitimacy and oversight, it's very similar. It's about the fact that oversight is seen as being trustworthy and honest, concerned about the well being of those they come in contact with, believing that oversight's authority ought to, ought to be accepted, um, making sure that people over that people accept um, oversight's decisions and recommendations, and people feel like they should comply not only with the law, but cooperate with the oversight agency. So it's kind of like this never ending circle. Oversight needs legitimacy 
in the eyes of all stakeholders. So you need police officers to feel that it's legitimate, community officers to feel like there's a, a legitimacy level there, um, elected officials for you to be able to do the job effectively. So it's very important to, to think about how you become a legitimate structure um, in the eyes of the broader community, one that um, includes all stakeholders. Um, I think it's also, I, I also like to say that in oversight, legitimacy is most often built through a commitment to the process, what I talked about before, that it's not about being in oversight so that you can serve the interests of one group versus another. It's being there so that you can have a process that is followed through, that it is fair and unbiased, and so therefore you can't be there for law enforcement or for community. You're there to make sure that the process is sound. Okay. So with that, let me move into a little bit about models. So I like to start here because creating impl and implementing effective civilian oversight that are responsive to the community's needs takes time, planning, and collaborative, transparent discussions among affected stakeholders. So I've had communities, I'll start with the creating piece. I've had communities contact me and say, so we'd like to have, they contact me in July and they say, we'd like to have an ordinance by August. How can we do that? Well, it takes time. It takes planning. It takes um, the work to make sure that the community has input into the process, but it doesn't end with the creation process. When you're implementing oversight or just keeping it um, consistent in an ongoing manner um, as, you, as you're doing the work 10 years from now. You still have to think about the fact that you have to take the time to be responsive to the community's needs, that you are making sure that you're collaborative and transparent and that discussions are being had among all the affected stakeholders. Those needs never end. So in oversight, we have four major models, the review focused, the monitoring or auditing, auditing focused model, the investigation focused, and, and then the other, the catch all, the hybrid models. I often get asked, is one of these models better than the other? And I have to tell you, each one of these has a, their strengths and weaknesses, absolutely. However, what when I'm asked that question, I often um, counter with when you're putting together a civilian oversight entity, it's really important to carefully consider the history and narrative of the community, the level of financial and political support, and the level of desired authority and independence that you want a civilian oversight entity to have, as well as expected outcomes. So it's really important, not only in the creation process, to think about what do you want this oversight mechanism to do, but it is really important to constantly think about what the expectations are along the way and make sure those are communicated clearly to all affected stakeholders. So with that, I'm going to move in and talk about some specifics of each of these four um, models. First, we have the review focus model. So they have the great benefit of community being able to provide input into the investigation process. When it is solely a review focused model, it often only has the ability to review the investigations completed by internally by the law enforcement agency. By being able to review investigations, however, you do have the ability to potentially increase public trust in the overall process. And then also an individual or a board um, 
that's authorized to review the completed internal investigations has this important ability to be able to agree or disagree with the findings and make that public so that the community knows that there's actual deliberation happening, um, that they know that it is not a rubber stamp um, mechanism, um, that actually careful consideration is going into all aspects of it. So if we're talking about the review focus model, um, talk a little bit more about the, their range of authority. So they often receive complaints and forward them to the law enforcement agency for investigation, as I mentioned. There's often professional staff, a director, executive director. Sometimes it can be a member of um, a city administrator, city manager's um, office who staffs the board. Um, they review completed investigation and also have the ability to provide feedback. Very often also they have the, the ability to remand cases back to the Internal Affairs Unit for further investigation. Um, in most cases, they have the ability to recommend dis disposition, and that can also be whether they agree or disagree with the disposition that Internal Affairs came to when they did their investigation. Um, they can recommend discipline. I will say that a, there are not that many solely review focused models that are able to um, recommend discipline. That's a fairly new phenomenon for them. Um, so we are starting to see it, just hasn't happened that much in the past. Um, and we are starting to see more and more of them able to make recommendations um, or review potential revisions to department policies and procedures. Very often there is a hearing component to um, the review focus model so that they can hear complaint or appeals um, either from the complainant or from the subject officer. They hold public forums. This is they're very much um, because they're so focused around the community element of civilian oversight, uh, often a large portion of what they do is community outreach and involvement. Um, and then they also, and this is the case with every oversight entity really, is that any meetings that are held are done so in accordance with state laws um, and union contracts so that all um, uh, so that they are not, um, so they're meeting all public requirements. So with that, let's move on to the investigation focused model. So if you'll notice here on the left, this is, I have pictures of the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board. Um, so I always like to make um, the case here for something that's not necessarily related to this slide, but a very important thing to remember is that when you're looking at different cities that have civilian oversight, um, I hear often when I'm talking about this, the CCRB in New York, oh, well, we're not the CCRB. Like that's too big. We don't, we don't need anything that they do. Well, no one is the CCRB. It's the largest uh, civilian oversight entity in the country, overseeing the largest police department in the country. Um, however, there are things that they do that are transferable. They can be um, looked at and made to work in your jurisdiction. So I never want people to negate the possibility of some doing something that a larger agency does. And I also would say to the CCRB, don't disregard something that's being done in a city that's much smaller than yours, because effective practices can be found everywhere. They just remember they can be scalable. So with that, um, back to the investigation focused model. So often this is seen as an excellent way to reduce bias in investigations um, and definitely reducing the perception of bias in investigations into uh, civilian complaints. Um, in an investigation focused model, you see full time civilian investigators that have very specialized training. A lot of times we see these investigators come from a background, sometimes of former law enforcement, 
um, private investigators, workplace people who have done workplace investigations, uh, and the requirement for ongoing training is often very high um, also within these oversight mechanisms so that they can meet, um, so that they can gain the legitimacy. Um, a lot of times um, law enforcement is very leery of outside investigation. Um, and so making sure you have those highly specialized um, investigators um, uh, is really important. Um, investigation conducted um, by an agency doesn't re rely on the department as much. However, it does rely on cooperation from the department to make sure that they have um, the ability to access witnesses and evidence and documents. And as I mentioned before, civilian led investigations often increase the community's trust in the investigation process. So a little bit about the range of authority of this model. As I mentioned before, they employ professionally trained staff. They can replace critical functions of a standard internal affairs unit altogether. There are, um, so it's interesting. There are examples like um, Washington DC's civilian oversight entity is a fully um, independent investigative model. Um, but if you go to cities um, like Seattle, one of their oversight mechanisms is um, the Office of Police Accountability. They actually have a civilian head of internal affairs who oversees a staff that is made not up, made up not only of um, civilian investigators, but also does have some sworn law enforcement investigators who have been seconded from um, the police department to work in that office for a period of time. So that it's um, it, it definitely is a mix there. Um, and in some cases we do see um, where there may be just in a civilian head of internal affairs um, that is placed into that position and then works with law enforcement on investigations. Um, sometimes an investigative model only has jurisdiction over certain types of allegations. Um, actually, uh, everywhere except in an oversight entity that's getting ready to, to uh, be implemented in Washington state, really oversight deals with civilian oversight of law enforcement as we know it now, deals mainly with administrative investigation, not criminal investigation. Um, but they do have the ability to conduct interviews of witnesses, um, both police and civilians, the ability to gather evidence. Um, they prepare investigative reports just as an internal affairs or um, a professional standards unit would do. Um, and then they rec make recommendations or findings of, as to whether the evidence supports the allegations. Um, and in some cases, um, those oversight entities can also recommend and or impose discipline, although those that can impose discipline are are fairly few. Um, but we also but we do see more often in this model the ability to recommend discipline. Next, we have the auditor monitor focus model. So this model really emerged as a compromise. Um, often when uh, civilian oversight is being implemented in uh, jurisdictions, there tends to be a clash between law enforcement agencies or unions and community activists. And so this was um, in its initial um, implementation, a model that could work on rooting out um, misconduct, but also could be proactive in a way that helped civilian or helped law enforcement agencies improve in their work. Um, they have much more robust reporting practices than any other civilian oversight mechanism. They promote long term systemic change. They will they tend to be and and I know this matters um, to city governments often they tend to be less expensive than an investigative agency, um, but more expensive than a review focused model. Um, and one of the things that I, I particularly like about this model is its ability to engage in all 
um, well, many, if not all, of the steps of the complaint process from taking in the intake um, portion. Um, some auditors um, very much like yours are able to engage themselves in every, if, if so, they so choose, in every step of the, of the process. Range of authority includes um, auditing, monitoring, investigating, reviewing, um, a very wide range of policies, practices, and procedures. Um, they ensure inv individual complaint investigations comply with, with the established policies and procedures. Um, they can do complaint intake, like I talked about, monitoring the disciplinary process, um, involving themselves in ongoing investigations. Um, and in many cases, they can make recommendations regarding any aspect of the law enforcement agency. And the auditor monitor, I will say, also does have a very important community engagement um, a component, which goes along uh, quite closely with the reporting. There's just a high level of transparency in this model. And I will say, just to give you an example of the benefit of this type of model, and they all have benefits, as I mentioned before, but I like to share the story about the Tucson police auditor some time ago was doing an audit and they realized after reviewing several cases that there seemed to be a tremendous amount of officers who had been reprimanded for the use of a chokehold, which is banned. Um, by policy in Tucson and has been for a long time. As she was reviewing this, she also noticed that their badge numbers were in close su succession. Um, and which meant that they were more than likely from the same recruit class. And so she went and did a little further investigation and realized that this particular recruit class had been trained by an officer who was not a member of the Tucson Police Department. He was from a neighboring agency who did allow chokeholds. So you have a recruit class who is taught incorrectly as to the policy regarding that maneuver. Um, and so now you're seeing complaints and discipline imposed because of it. So once she realized the problem, she was able to go um, to the chief and recommend that there that this recruit class be retrained and trained correctly um, as to the policies and procedures regarding chokeholds. Um, so, and since that time, um, although they've had one or two here and there, um, they have not had the type of issues with that um, maneuver that they had had at one time. So that's just an example of how the, the effect that this kind of work can have on the long-term um, procedures of a police department. Next, we have hybrid models. So I will say it is very hard to find, particularly any new oversight agency um, like yourself, that isn't a hybrid model. Um, one of the things to remember is that there's two types of hybrids. There's a hybrid agency like yours where there are two types of mo models combined, two or more types of models combined into one agency. There are also hybrid systems. Examples of hybrid systems are, um, a great example is the city of Seattle. Um, so they have, they have the Office of Police Authority, or I mean, Office of Office of Police Accountability, um, sorry, uh, who does investigations, their investigative model. But then separately from the OPA, they also have the Community Police Commission, which really focuses and acts more as a review um, model. Um, they also have a huge community outreach component to them. Um, and then you also have um, the Office of the Inspector General, which is a completely separate entity who not only does audits um, of law enforcement, but also of the OPA 
and some of the work of the commission, community commission. So that's a system where there are completely separate oversight mechanisms that operate independently of each other, but do have some overlap in the work that they do, and they're all within the same city. So a hybrid model, as I mentioned, has one or more, uh, well, two or more elements of the other models. Um, they often come about because they're being developed to meet very specific needs of the community and also work to conform um, with state or local laws. There are um, state statutes that do pose issues for what we might consider effective law enforcement. If we could get everything we wanted, that would be fantastic, but there's often some existing statute that prevents everything that we'd like to have in an oversight mechanism from actually being um, included. Um, so what tends to happen is that oversight kind of molds to it, the, the specific um, um, state or local laws so that it can still um, be effective and also take those um, laws into consideration. Um, hybrid models are often a modification of a previous oversight agency. Uh, Seattle is an excellent example of that. The Office of the Inspector General uh, uh, actually used to be just the Office of the Police Auditor. Um, and the Community Police Commission at one point didn't exist at all in the process. And that is a, a fairly uh, or a, a newer aspect of that, that um, agency. So common oversight functions when we're talking about the hybrid models. They often review completed internal affairs investigations, unless we're talking about the oversight system like we see in Seattle or in New York or in Chicago, where they have an independent investigatory authority within the system that does do those investigations. Um, but being able to review completed internal affairs investigations is one of the most common oversight functions across um, all of the hybrid models. Um, and I already talked about our second bullet point, but then pro also professional staff are also a very important um, part of this. Um, those who receive input and feedback from the boards or commissions that they're working with. Um, so, and, and also can help to oversight, um, I'm sorry, evaluate the oversight entity or entities that are in place while still um, having that voice from the community be very prominent in, in the everyday functioning of the oversight entity. Okay, so we are um, at about just over the halfway mark here. And so I wanted to check in with you and see, um, I have a 10 minute, a 15 minute break planned, um, but I wanna make sure that's what people need right now, or if people feel they just wanna keep on going, um, I wanna check in with all of you for a moment. Um, I think, um, I think we'll probably, we'll probably wanna, wanna take, take a break. break. Okay. But it may not need to be 15 minutes, I don't know. Um, I'll, let's put it this way. I'll entertain a motion for a 10 minute break. That way we won't be too far off time if that's good enough uh, for everybody. Somebody I'll move for that. I'll okay. move for a 10 minute break. Terrific, second. I need a second. Gary, I second. Uh, all in favor, just say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so 10 minutes would be 719. So I'll see you all in 10 minutes. Great, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you. The background is so colorful and interesting. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. I know it's hard to talk to <laughs> a PowerPoint presentation on Zoom. It's like the only downside of us all. Well, and occasionally, in some ways. occasionally one of your faces pops up and I feel like I'm interacting with an audience. I get very <laughs> excited. Um, but yeah. Very attentive. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm glad you're all hanging in there with me. Absolutely. I'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, everyone. I hope um, I hope that was enough of a break. We're back at 719. Uh, I unfortunately am going to have to drop off a little bit before the end of the meeting. And in order to do that, I need to um, nominate my vice chair as a chair pro tem so that he can close out. But to do that, I need somebody to second that motion. So second. <laughs> I'll second it. Okay, I got two seconds. Great. Um, and then we need to take a vote. So, all in favor, just say aye. 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 Okay, great. Um, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, but before I leave, I just I wanted to thank you again for taking the time. Um, I actually watched the one that you did for the um, for the Arlington board because they, um, yeah, and I I and I find it fascinating all over again. So I really enjoy this, and I really appreciate um, all the time you're taking. I look forward to our next trainings as well. And I do apologize that I'm going to drop off around eight o'clock, but um, thank you again for everything. And uh, I leave it in Gary's capable hands. So anyway, go ahead, take it away. Thanks. Well, thanks for being here, Lisa. Okay, so let's move on to um, the next portion of tonight's presentation is focused on the principles for effective civilian oversight of law enforcement. Before I talk about the 13 principles individually, I, that piece, that second part of it, the principles for effective practices um, in oversight, I think it's really important to talk about the framework surrounding effective practices. So when de designing civilian oversight of law enforcement, um, people almost always ask about what are the best practices. When it comes to oversight, stakeholders want to know what is proven to work, what's proven not to work, how their oversight can be strengthened or improved, and how desired outcomes can be achieved. And they a lot of times want to do this with the term best. Um, they want um, data that says that this particular practice works better than this. Um, however, uh, with all of that said, it is important to consider uh, both the limitations and the applicability of a best practices approach to civilian oversight, um, particularly given the limitations that exist Civilian or, or NACOL proposes that we use an effective practices approach instead, centered on the 13 foundational principles that we're going to talk about um, in order to implement successful, effective, and sustainable oversight. So with that in mind, um, let's I want to dig a little deeper into the best versus effective practices. So in work that NACOL's done previously, we found that there's not necessarily any best practice <clears throat> path to establishing oversight or any best model um, that will be effective for all jurisdictions. Because that's the other question I get. Not only what are the proven best practices, but also what's everyone wants to know what is the model that I would recommend um, for any jurisdiction. And that is not a question I can answer. What can be considered best is a function of the unique elements and needs of the community and the jurisdiction that's looking to establish the civilian oversight mechanism um, or to enhance it, an existing one. Um, the elements that go into it ultimately shape what form of civilian oversight is possible feasible, and in line with community expectations. There's that word again, expectations. In other words, the best form of civilian oversight depends on the local circumstances. Also, I think it's important to note that the social and political complexities of a jurisdiction, jurisdiction make identifying successful practices used in one jurisdiction, picking them up and putting them into another jurisdiction. Um, that becomes very challenging potentially fraught with errors of interpretation. Um, it can be unreliable. And so it's, it's, in other words, 
nearly impossible to pick something up that's working great in one community and expect it to be placed in another and work perfectly. It's also important to note that, that oversight has expanded in a decentralized manner. Um, very distinct, varying local contexts make oversight agencies across the country very heterogeneous. Um, and varying in terms of over organizational structure, levels of authority, resources, and procedures. Um, a lot of times this happens from what I was talking about before we took our break. Sometimes this can happen just because you might have an excellent um, oversight mechanism that is working incredibly well for a community in Virginia that it would be nearly impossible to replicate because of existing state statutes in California. Um, so there's all those elements as well. So there's um, the form that it takes eventually. Again, I want to emphasize it must be possible, feasible, and in line with community expectations. So the limitations of the best practices approach, just to kind of go over these again to help really drill this in. Um, the complexities of the social and political context make it difficult. Um, the goals of civilian oversight do not really lend themselves to systematic comparative measurement. In addition, there is no across the board standard for what met data is being collected from over one oversight entity to another. Now, believe me, we are working on that because we see the, the necessity of it, but because of that decentralized um, development um, and that no two are alike, they tend to operate and collect the data that's most helpful um, and needed in their jurisdiction. Um, also, there's a lack of standardized definitions um, and and that, along with the, the data uh, collection issue I just mentioned, makes cross-jurisdictional comparison very difficult. And of course, the no two civilian oversight agencies are the same is also problematic to this, to a best practices approach. So instead, we move to the effective practices framework. Um, it's important to recalibrate existing stakeholder, practitioner, and community expectations regarding best practices so that we can move to the effective practices framework. It is very important to remember that in civilian oversight, there were always several paths to success. What's most important is that the mechanisms are developed to allow for flexibility, but still take into consideration the criteria that's thought to be crucial to successful, sustainable, and effective civilian oversight. To do this, core values and principles, which we'll be talking about, um, need to be taken into consideration. And the experience and wisdom that comes from the work already being done needs to be valued. And in essence, listen to the lessons learned. Um, one of the wonderful things about the civilian oversight community is no one wants anyone in oversight to have to reinvent the wheel. People are much uh, more willing to um, discuss uh, failures and successes than I see um, in other industries that I've worked in or other communities that I've worked in. Um, so really being able to take into consideration the work that and experience of others is also really important in this framework. I think it's also important to, to mention this piece about um, valuing diverse perspectives also extends beyond experienced practitioners, but also into all of the stakeholders, making sure that stakeholder input and dialogue is prioritized in your process. You don't want to be working in, an, in a vacuum because you'll never reach that effective, sustainable level if you are. So recommendations for effective practices. So <laughs> it's about finding 
um, looking at different authorities and practices and seeing if it's an appropriate fit for your local context. Um, not all recommended practices will be appropriate for every jurisdiction or every model. I should mention that as well. Um, recommendations must be discussed with local stakeholders and feedback gathered. Um, you need to look at how will this practice strengthen civilian oversight in relation to the 13 principles, but also evaluate strength and, and weaknesses in relation to the 13 principles. For instance, does adopting a particular recommendation achieve intended outcomes or um, looking at it as if one recommendation that strengthens a pr principle may not address or may inadvertently affect a specific weakness. Um, so an example of that would be implementing a practice or authority that requires a large budget in a community where there is not a large budget to be had, that that budget um, and resource does not necessarily exist for the type of authority that you're asking for. It doesn't mean it shouldn't, but the, the local will, political will may mean that it either does not or will not exist for you at that moment. Um, all of this becomes very important when you're talking about um, how you look at strengthening um, one principle in relation to another um, becomes very important in the negotiation practices, particularly when you're implementing or looking to en enhance an existing oversight structure. I think also just making sure that you continually look at unintended consequences is very important. You don't want to do more harm than good. So with that, I'm going to move into the 13 principles. So I think it's important to note before I start going into each of these individually that NACOL did not sit down and come up with 13 principles. Um, what we did is look at the work of academics and oversight practitioners who have come up with parts of this here and there and have pulled together um, into one place what we as an organization feel like are the main principles for effective civilian oversight of law enforcement. So I always like to um, talk about, you know, people like academics like Sam Walker, who for a long time was the only academic really working in this field who came up with some of uh, the principles you see here. Um, practitioners like Barbara Tard and uh, Catherine Olson and Richard Rosenthal, who also have done work um, in this area and kind of taking all of those and putting them into one place um, in a way that we felt would really affect um, the work of an implementation of civilian oversight in, an, in a positive manner. So first, let's start with independence. So, so Independence is the absence of real or perceived influence from law enforcement, political actors, and other special interests. There are three different types of independence that we often talk about, and that's structural, um, which is making sure that your oversight is entity is separate, um, both administratively and organizationally. Um, political independence, um, which really refers to the extent which political actors can influence your civilian oversight entity. And then also operational. So even if you have great structural and political independence, it's really important to be able to operate independently um, because of the, the possibility of being um, what perceived as being co-opted if you have a lack of control over your operations. Um, it also, independence also has a lot to do with impartiality, fairness, and working in a manner that maintains stakeholder trust is very important in independence. Next, we have scope of authority and, or I'm sorry, clear, defined, and adequate jurisdiction and authority. So, adequate um, jurisdiction and authority 
are very important when we're talking about achieving the goals and mandates of the oversight agency. Um, it varies very widely from agency to agency. I would say uh, from re reviewing your enabling legislation, you have a broad, uh, fairly broad amount of jurisdiction and authority. But you know, each oversight model requires different combinations of authority at the most uh, lowest level in order to effectively perform its, its work. So like if you're an investigative model, this might look like you're having the ability to interview all the witnesses. If you're a review model, it might look like the ability to address, you know, the authority to address deficiencies and promote corrective action. Uh, if you're an auditor, uh, this might look like the authority to identify matters of concern and also having comprehensive access to law enforcement records, data, and executives. So, it may look different from model to model, and definitely some of those things I mentioned might uh, be combined in a hybrid situation, but all of them are important in order, um, a lot of those things can't happen unless you have the jurisdiction and authority to do so. Um, stakeholders in the process, of course you are beyond this point now, but um, a lot of times, it's really important to get stakeholder um, input on the types of authority that are most important to them. We work with a lot of jurisdictions who are in the process of making recommendations for civilian oversight mechanisms and having the conversations about what are the authorities that are most important, because I can tell you most uh, most jurisdictions and and those bodies that are tasked with making recommendations for what is ultimately the oversight entity. A lot of times when they're talking about authorities, they start up here, maybe with with all the authorities and they end up somewhere down here. Um, so knowing what is most important is always very um, it should be at the top of the list, particularly when you enter that negotiation um, period where things like feasibility um, are start to, to pop up in the conversation. Um, and again, I think it's in, important um, when we're talking about clearly defined jurisdiction and authority is that when legislation is being put in place, it really needs to be clear enough so that it does not leave room for conflicting interpretations of specific authorities, but at the same time, it needs to be broad enough to allow for operational flexibility. So not an easy task, but very much one that needs to be kept in mind as that process is, is um, is underway. And it also is something to consider for when recommendations are made to for changes down the road um, to any um, existing civilian oversight entity. So unfettered access to records is principle number three. So in order to meet some of the oversight functions that are mandated in enabling legislation, there has to be a minimal level of information access to actually carry out that mandate. And I know that um, I heard you mention at the beginning that you're still working on your MOU. Um, I will say that there are examples um, of MOUs out there that could act as a guide as you're in that process. So please let me know if that's something that you're interested in. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we are very interested. <laughs> well, there there is one that I often provide and actually um, is it, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Is it um, Mumi or, or Mummy? That's it's, Mummy. It's Mummy. Mummy. Okay, well, I know one of the, you will probably know about this MOU. One of the MOUs that I often refer people to look at is the one from the New Orleans Police Department and the independent police monitor um, which was uh a um <laughs> it was hard fought for 
Um, but it is often one that has a lot of information that can be useful for other jurisdictions looking to implement MOUs. And I also feel like when an oversight entity and the New Orleans Police Department can come together on, a, <laughs> on an MOU, that maybe all things are possible. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, and I have a, a copy of that MOU to share with the COB members. Um, I know that they're also in the process of revising it um, mm -hmm. and improving on it. So it's not probably going to be very soon. It may not be the most current version, um, but super comprehensive, especially, you know, because it was formulated in the midst of a consent decree and um, you know, and so for that reason, it's going to be really extensive in terms of policies and um, <clears throat> effective practices for accountability and transparency. Um, I think the one thing that I'm anticipating that we'll want to cross reference that with is um, an MOU from a model that also has a community oversight board as well, because New Orleans doesn't have a community oversight board. Um, so to that extent, the MOU is mostly focusing on um, the relationship between the police monitor and NOPD, which our MOU will probably have um, it'll correlate with ours in the sense that it'll, most of the MOU is like terminology or like agreements about how to let's say share information or whatnot with an auditor or a police monitor's office and um, the corresponding police department um, but yeah we're, we're trying to figure out exactly how to um, to what extent and how to incorporate the COB's role in the MOU and, and what needs to be addressed there. Wonderful well and I'll also um, look for some that have that the community um, uh, board component um, as well um, to see if I can find some examples of that for Thank you. Thank you. That would be super helpful. Absolutely. Um, so also when we're talking about access to records, it's it's not just about having the access, it's about having timely access, um, making sure that there are time limits on the amount of um, on the duration of time that it takes between requests and receiving the information. Um, and then also it's in addition, it's not just about department records and information, it's also about facilities. And I say that I know that you do not have. Um, well, I really say that because there are um, oversight entities who do also have jail um, oversight. And so having access to facilities is also incredibly important in that in that um, in that realm. Um, and I think that you all are lucky in the sense that your enabling legislation mandates the necessity of an MOU. Um, not all of them do. And so because of that, you're already you and the police department are being told that there needs to be a what and a how. And it and it needs to be in writing um, and timeframes need to be also part of that. So I think that part is really good. And now it's just a part the point of of creating it and having it um, effectuated. The other the next one is access to law enforcement executives and internal affairs staff. So. It's really important to have a sustained dialogue to promote cooperation and support for both roles, both your role and law enforcement's roles, whether it's the executive or the internal affairs staff. Um, you really, when communication breaks down, oversight is nearly impossible. So that is a, um, a relationship that, and uh, a level of cooperation that needs to be um, continued. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be periods of disagreement um, and frustration on both parts, more than likely, um, but it um, really does um, help the process. Um, and I, I will say, and often this comes up when we're talking about implementing civilian oversight, but I do think it carries through um, into the day-to-day -day work of it that 
um, we find that any group, any stakeholder group that feels like something is being done with them as opposed to to them makes for a better process and a much more effective one overall. So something to consider as you move forward in the work. Um, I mentioned timeliness um, earlier when we were talking about access to information, but also <clears throat> uh, re the requirement of law enforcement agencies to provide things in a timely and written uh, manner that's available to the public, which your enabling legislation already deals with to a great extent, um, is also really important. Um, Next, we have full cooperation. Cooperation is absolutely necessary to be able to to carry out your mandate. There's just no way around it. Um, but the cooperations and the conditions of the cooperation need to respect uh, due process rights and an individual's constitutional rights against self incrimination. So please keep that in mind as you're looking for full cooperation from the agency. Um, I like to give the example the, um, of the Chicago um, Civilian Office of Police Accountability, um, who in their enabling legislation has taken this full cooperation to an additional level. I'll, I'll just quote um, what the legislation actually says. It says, it shall be the duty of every officer, employee, department, and agency of the city to cooperate with the Civilian Office of Police Accountability in any investigation undertaken pursuant to this chapter. Any employee who violates any provision of this chapter shall be subject to discipline, including but not limited to discharge. So I will say that that is at one end of the spectrum, and then there are agencies who have nothing in writing about what happens when there's no cooperation. And so the thought is the MOU that you'll have in place will have something in between there that will call for cooperation to allow you to carry out your mandate um, and, and prohibit um, a lack of cooperation. Next, we have sustained stakeholder support. So I will say when there is um, a crisis in a community, um, establishing civilian oversight can be politically expedient, um, but really it requires um, ongoing support from and commitment from stakeholders. And when I'm talking about stakeholders, I'm talking about members of the community, elected officials, law enforcement, um, city staff. I mean, there are, everybody who has a stake in this process is considered a stakeholder group. And if you do not have um, support from your stakeholders, um, at least meaningful support, oversight can be undermined. Um, that can look like, um, failure to provide adequate resources or authority to the agency, um, selecting ineffective uh, managers or directors, or leaving board appointments vacant for very long periods of time. Um, that is, I will say, there are cities that probably are not doing it on purpose, but thinking through ahead to when you're going to have vacancies as much as you can, um, vacancies, on the board so that that process can start to fill those vacancies is really important because with seven members, if you're missing one or two people, you are you are missing a critical mass of perspective um, and, and input. Um, lack of support can also look like disregarding the recommendations or findings um, and just an unwillingness to address um, issues. Um, the ability to maintain support from your stakeholder groups, um, that lies very much in your community outreach piece. And sometimes that's the community outreach of uh, the work that the, the board is doing. Sometimes it's an, it is the, the work, the day-to-day -day work that 
the oversight agency staff is doing. So it's definitely um, that piece can be held on to by both. I also think, and I'll use uh, New Orleans as a as a um, example again. Sustained stakeholder support not only means I don't want to talk just about the negative part about when um, when you have a lack of that support, but when you have full support of your stakeholders, um, when your agency becomes under attack or it loses funding or it's starting to have problems with cooperation, you will have stakeholders that thoroughly support you um, who will who will come up and and speak on your behalf. They'll fight for your agency's independence if that's the issue or adequate budget if that's the the issue. Um, New Orleans is an excellent example in, in the early years when um, they were not independent um, and were having some issues with being able to do their job in a way that really carried out the mandate effectively. Uh, stakeholders, they went to the mat for them um, and uh, they ended up with a better mechanism because of it. So stakeholders are very important at the beginning and all throughout um, the agency's work. Next, we have adequate funding and resources. So I'll just be honest with you, I have never heard an agency tell me <laughs> that they are overfunded and have more resources than they know what to do with. Um, over, but however, when you put authorities into enabling uh, legislation, it's really important for a, for um, local government to actually back those up and allow those to be carried out um, through um, adequate and necessary resources. Um, so it's and and those resources look like retaining experienced staff, um, making sure that. Uh, the board has what it needs to do um, its job on an ongoing basis, whether that's receiving adequate training, um, doing community outreach, getting reports out to the public. They need to be resor resourced in a way that they can do all of those things. And I, I will say there is, I, I get a lot of um, emails and calls by people asking what so what should I be asking for? What kind of budget do I need? Well, there are a lot of factors that go into it. Needs vary greatly based on the model and the region. I know that what an oversight professional is being paid in California is very different from what an oversight professional is being paid in Indiana. So um, all of those things need to be um, taken into account. Public reporting and transparency. So the issuance of public reports is critical um, to the agency's credibility. It's the point where the public um, and your elected officials know what you're doing. Um, they know what's happening in the realm of civilian oversight within their, their community. Um, your reports shouldn't be censored. Um, they need to be written in a, in a way that they are accessible to all members of your community. They need to have as much information related to your mandate as possible. That can be disclosed by law because there definitely are limitations to what you can put in a report like that. Um, but there are also, um, but the greatest amount of information you can disclose as allowed by law is great. Um, because that's that transparency piece. It gives the community as much information as they possibly can get on what is often a very opaque process. Uh, many agencies are required to do an annual report. Um, I know you have your annual report and then you also have reports related to the, the cases that you're reviewing. Um, but they also have um, there are some agencies. There are also agencies out there who do um, special reports um, when they find uh, uh, 
you'll find this a lot in auditor and monitor models. A great example is um, at one point, the uh, New York Office of the Inspector General did a an audit on use of force reporting. So not incidences of use of force, use of force, but how officers were actually reporting those those incidents. And they found um, they had a long list of things that they found uh, another list of recommendations as far as not only reporting, but even changes to the form on which um, the, the incidents were reported. So it was a fairly comprehensive audit and set of recommendations. As a result, um, the the New York Police Department, um, New York City Police Department, um, adopted I almost a hundred percent of the recommendations. However, they not only did a report on their audit and the the findings and the recommendations, but they also then two years later went back and they did another audit so that they could look at what was the status of the, the implementation of the recommendations. And not only that, those things that had been implemented, were they making a difference? Um, and so an additional report was um, put out on that secondary audit and um, set of rec resulting recommendations. So the more information you can get out there, the better, particularly when you're taking time to do audits and investigations um, or policy reviews, that information is important to the community um, and your elected officials. Um, and so being able to put that out, I think is very helpful. Policy and pattern analysis. So really looking at um, policies and practices address systemic problems in law enforcement agencies. We kind of talked around this quite a bit in the training today, but doing the analysis is really important and an essential step. You really can't formulate recommendations unless you're doing the analysis. Um, it needs to be data driven and evidence based um, and about specific issues um, that uh, and when it's about specific issues, it allows you to pinpoint areas of concern and then therefore follow through with recommendations for improvement on those specific areas. So. Another important part of this is that. Um, looking at how misconduct um, incidents are handled, whether or not they're properly investigated, um, it's really a very important tool for building public confidence. So it's about doing the work um, in order to have some of the goals and outcomes um, of effective civilian oversight. So doing that proper policy and pattern and pattern analysis is a tool to help build um, public confidence um, and also work towards the systemic and long term change um, that that your model is hoping um, to affect. So the next two I often talk about in tandem, but their community outreach and community involvement. It's really the output and the input of civilian oversight. It's my opinion and and obviously NACLES because it's one of the principles that agencies should dedicate a significant amount of resources to community outreach and not just dollar resources, but also manpower. Um, because it has the potential for such great impact in your work. It allows them to know more about you. It allows them to know and, and the agency itself, the mechanism. It also allows all of that work and that you're doing on the reports and the audits. It allows the public to have more access to it. That stakeholder relationships that I was talking about, this is where you build it. Um, it also allows you to recruit volunteers, um, uh, facilitate learning and greater understanding not only about what you are doing, but also about law enforcement policies and practices. Um, it helps to, to build improved relationships between community and law enforcement and the civilian oversight mechanism. 
Uh, it also helps to build those coalitions that may help you in the long run. And uh, when you are working with a community, you have inherently a greater capacity for problem solving because you are um, you are ex extending your the input probabilities or or access points um, for input exponentially. Um, and the more people you have working on the problem, the better. On the other side of this is the input. Um, it's important to get the input and involvement of the community um, on how oversight should function and the issues that it, the community is seeing. Um, and that is not just the beginning of your process, that is ongoing. Um, when you are establishing a civilian oversight mechanism, it's important to determine the appropriate degree um, of the initial community involvement and the ongoing involvement. So it's important for you as a board to sit down and really sketch out what this is going to look like. What, how will the community be involved in your process? Um, it's important to remember that how they're involved can take different forms. Um, but no matter what form it takes, it needs to represent the local population's composition and diversity. Even though it's easier in some cases to get input from certain members of the community, it's in oversight, it is in particularly important not to always do what's easiest. Um, sometimes the most important information can come from the hardest to get. Um, so making sure you have a plan for reaching all members of the community um, is very important. So next we have conf confidentiality, anonymity, and protection from retaliation. So this is um, very important. And I know that your um, enabling legislation lays out um, the need for you to fo follow all um, state and local laws regarding confidentiality. Um, but it's also important, you have to remember that um, people who come to you with complaints in an anonymous manner, they do so for a reason. I am the first one to admit that anonymous complaints are very difficult because you don't have a whole lot of information. You can't go back to the person to get additional information. Uh, <clears throat> and so outcomes of complaints are sometimes difficult. Um, or difficult to even get to an outcome of a complaint. Um, however, for some people, and I know we talked about this, and, and David's story I think is very important here, is that there are many people who don't feel comfortable making complaints. And there are some that the only way they're going to feel comfortable is if it's anonymous. So respecting that anonymity is very important. Um, and also, it's important to provide protection from re retaliation. Um, those who come forth with com to file complaints or with additional information um, do so often um, not easily. Um, and I can tell you of some um, complaints where you might have a complaint where someone makes a complaint in good faith because they believe what was done was wrong, but uh, in the heat of the moment might have forgotten some details or might have misheard some of the things said. Um, and so those are things that you as a board are going to have to take into consideration when, when you are reviewing investigations um, and that anybody who does investigations um, primarily also has to take into consideration. And so our last, um, our last principle goes back to procedural justice and legitimacy. So it's, it's really centered on participation, uh, objective and neutral decision-making, respect and trustworthy mo uh, motives. Um, and, and just being part of the process. Um, 
individuals um, find themselves more satisfied with procedures that give them a voice and the ability to participate by allowing them to communicate their views on specific situations. So having an accessible complaint process is one way that you can achieve that. Another element of the procedural justice and legitimacy is the neutrality. So objectivity and neutrality and decision make decision making as opposed to um, decision making stemming from personal bias or interest increase perceptions of fairness and legitimacy um, as well as objectivity in the process. Um, Next, we talk about dignity uh, and respect. Treatment that is dignified, respectful, um, and recognizes an individual's rights um, is strongly tied to perception of fairness and legitimacy. So I, I can't underscore enough the importance of the treatment. And one of the reasons I underscore it is because most um, most oversight entities that look at misconduct complaints um, will often, the majority of them will often fall into the um, behavioral complaint. Um, a lot of times the complaint stems from how people were treated. So looking at this is really important. Um, the final element is trust in the motives driving decision making. So procedures are more likely to be perceived as uh, fair if people feel that decision makers actually care about people's well-being and concerns. Um, and also that they explain their decisions in ways that account for the person they're dealing with needs. Um, when you take all of these four things together, um, it forms the basis for providing effective civilian oversight that's felt to be legitimate by the community served and legitimate um, by the overseen law enforcement agency. Um, so, you know, it's one of the reasons we leave it, leave it until last. It's a very important principle. And I also, I actually uh, don't always say this um, when we're doing the training. I had a very interesting conversation with an academic today who was talking about, he, he reviews thousands of hours of body worn camera footage for uh, work that um, his university is doing. And one of the things he mentioned, we were talking about the importance of procedural justice. And one of the things he mentioned is that he often sees in video that procedural justice is exercised, but it's compacted and it's all at the very end. So I think it's really important to note that procedural justice has to be something that happens throughout, that you need to be treating people with dignity and respect, giving them a voice, um, it, and uh, acting in a neutral and unbiased manner, not just at the beginning or the end of a process, but throughout. And this is very important for oversight entities. We're not just talking about how police um, are interacting with the public. It's also about how you are interacting with the community, with law enforcement and other stakeholders in the process. So I think we often just attach procedural justice and legitimacy to the actions of police, but I think it's also something that civilian oversight, um, members of civilian oversight also have to take um, very seriously. So with that, um, I we have some time for some additional conversation and um, questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. When, um, I will note that the last slide on this does have my email address. So if, um, since you all have a copy of it, um, please feel free. If you don't have questions now, but you may have questions later that come up, um, please don't hesitate to send me an email. I have, I have a question. I have a question. 
So are you familiar with uh, oversight boards or agencies that do surveys to the community to gather information? Um, I'm just curious about, and I have to look at our ordinance in particular, but, uh, and I'm not sure that this is something that as a group we would want to do, but I'm just curious as to our ability. I mean, we, we obviously can gather information from the police department uh, about policies and, and data and so forth, but I'm curious about gathering information uh, in a survey for <clears throat> format or some other format from, from Arlington residents, whether other, other boards have done stuff like that. Great question. So there are um, there are boards who have taken it on as part of their engagement and involvement process. There are also a few that are mandated um, to con to collect community feedback. Um, the the BART independent police auditor um, is that's one of their requirements. The board um, and the auditor. Um, one of the things that I recommend is that. And I, I realize budgets are not um, always full of extra money for things like um, bringing on consultants who are experts in the development of surveys. But that's really important because um, one of the things that oversight tends to have issues with are measurements. What can we measure? But community input in the process um, over time is an imp is a measurement um, to see how community perceptions of law enforcement of an oversight entity of the complaint process itself um, measuring those things can be very helpful and informative to the work that you're doing so um, i think it's a great idea i just think that it it definitely requires um, having someone who knows how to develop a survey that will get you objective information Thanks. Hey, and uh, this is Gary, I think, for asking questions. Why don't we raise our hands and then I'll kind of I'll kind of call on the next person here just so we can kind of keep order. And and what I'm going to do at the end. Uh, so it's uh, we have scheduled till 830. So let's go ahead and go at the questions for a while. And what I'd like to do at the end is I'm going to kind of go through everybody and just kind of ask you for a very short you know, less than one minute, you know, what was your main takeaway tonight? Just so we can hear from everybody. But uh, I think this is a great stage for our next training. So, Mummy, over to you. Thanks, Gary, and thanks for keeping us in order. Um, first of all, hi. I didn't get an opportunity to um, introduce myself before the meeting started, but um, I'm Mami Ibrahim, the Independent Policing Auditor for Arlington County, which I think you know. Um, and I'll be working alongside all of these awesome community members um, to create this model and um, in Arlington County specifically. And I, and I often say that we're kind of building the car as we drive it. Um, and so my question to you was, um, are there models or practices um, that we should look to um, in determining, I heard you say during the presentation that a, a better term is effective practices, not best practices, because there's not a one size fits all model. So I'm trying to avoid saying best practices <laughs> here. But um, is there, you know, um, are, are there models that we could look to that would help us um, kind of just get a sense of what we should be thinking about in creating this model, specifically with a community oversight board involved, and then also secondarily, but I think kind of like coinciding with that um, is how we kind of shape our priorities or begin to think about what to look for in shaping our priorities. So yes, to all of those things. So there are, um, they're one of the fastest growing types of hybrid models um, in oversight is yours. The community board paired with an auditor or a monitor. Um, so there are lots of examples out there, not only of ones that have been in existence for a while, but also those that um, are just maybe 
four or five steps ahead of you. So they may have some very recent lesson learned lessons learned that could be helpful as you implement um, this. So I'm happy to pull together um, that. I think what might be helpful is not only pulling together, you know, some of the you know policies and procedures and things like that that they're using, but also putting you in contact with the auditor um, and putting members of the commission or board in contact with other board members out there who are doing the works because the perspective is different um, mm -hmm. and the needs can be different as well. So um, making sure everybody has um, what they need, but definitely there are some great examples out, of, out there of both older agencies and newer ones who are doing the work. Thank you, Cami. That's super helpful. And thank you again for being here with us tonight and dedicating First, such a long time to sit with us and train no, us on, and extend all of your knowledge to us. No, this is great. I'm glad to be with all of you tonight. Thank you. Um, while we're waiting for any other questions, I want to have a tag along question to Mummy. So one of the things that we're going to, we're just going to start with a draft, but we're going to really bring in the whole team. And one of our tasks is to build, first of all, a roadmap to qualified, but then it's kind of a roadmap, you know, kind of for for this next year that we can all kind of synchronize around and because um, right now it's probably not clear, you know, what's first, what's second. So I think in addition to what you can provide mummy just from the topic you shared, just, you know, we're kind of looking at what's first, you know, right now obviously being trained is one of the best messages we can share with the community. You know, it's like, hey, we're professional. We're going to be a qualified board. We're, we're doing effective practice. See, I've already got off the best. Um, but we're, you know, but but that's one of the key themes right now are outreach and stuff like that, getting a you know meet and greet. But anything that you can share regarding, because it's so much you can kind of like be, go do everything and do nothing well. But we kind of want to just get synchronized going down road. We're volunteers. We're, you know, everybody's hanging in here doing great. Got a wonderful team. But I think that's a context that you know I personally would like help with as I work with the rest of the team of kind of because we all kind of have things we're picking up from our ride alongs and and various things that we're finding out. But anything in the effective arena as you know, what's first um, or what things at the front half, maybe, you know, just to help us kind of prioritize our time and our effort. Absolutely. So realizing that it feels like you need to do everything at once, but you can't do everything at once. I will say that there are a few things that you can do simultaneously that have kind of get the ball rolling, have a big impact, however you want to describe it. So of course, the MOU and policies and procedures are really important. Um, they're going to guide how you, um, not only how you're able to do the work and interact with other stakeholders, but also those policies and procedures that kind of define the role of you as board members are really important. Um, it, it feels from this short time with you this evening that you have got an amazing group of people here um, and putting in policies and procedures so that everybody is on the same page, everybody has the same expectations. is just, it's a great solid starting point for everyone. The other thing, and it's a, a little more complicated, is developing the complaint intake process. Because since you're able to receive complaints, you're also able to establish other locations to put your information in. Um, I think that that is one thing that the community is going to notice first, is how easy is that process? It's a way for community to feel like something has happened by, by the intake process no longer being held solely in the police department. So it has a visual impact. Um, they're not gonna be able, nor will they maybe care about your policies or procedures or your MOU, but they definitely would will care about the, the intake uh, process and its accessibility. And then as soon as you can, I do realize I appreciated your comment, Gary, about kind of putting together 
that plan of what you want to do in the next year. I think that that's really important so that you have this vision of what your steps are and what you want to accomplish in the first year. Um, a lot of oversight entities, it, it takes a good year to be solidly off the ground and fully functioning. Um, there's, you know, hiring of staff, there's the training, there's, uh, you know, doing things like putting together your strategic plan for the next year or even two. Um, but in the midst of all of that, I also think to the extent that you're able to be able to start messaging to the community that you're there. Also, it gives you an opportunity to start setting expectations for what you can, what your mandate actually is. Um, and that also, I know you, you're doing ride alongs, but also visiting roll calls so that officers get to know who you are, uh, whether you're the auditor or the uh, member of the board, um, I think is incredibly helpful. Um, because even in the most supportive environments, and by supportive, I mean those that uh, law enforcement is, is not um, fighting oversight, there tends to be little understanding of what your role actually is. And so helping to promote that and, and them hearing it from the source rather than their friends uh, is very important to the overall success of your work. Thank you, Cami. That was that was an outstanding answer. I think I saw a couple of us taking notes and on my ride along, I detected that like, what, who are you guys kind of a deal? So thank you for that input. I see uh, Martin, uh, you've got the floor. Sorry, are you waiting on me? Oh, we can hear you. Yes, now. go ahead. You have the floor. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so my question was, um, I heard you saying that um, one of the first things that the public might notice about the COB or um, what they might actually care about is the complaint intake process. Mm -hmm. um, as time moves on, what might they notice and care about, um, you know, as the COB develops? So that's a great question. And um, it, it, they will care about things you have control over and things you don't have control over. Um, so some of the things that we see as time moves on, those reports will be very important. Um, and those community outreach and or, or engagement events will be important um, so that people can see the work that's being done. Um, because on a daily basis, I mean, they're going to be inundated with visuals, not even necessarily from your just jurisdiction, but from others that they superimpose on your jurisdiction. And so letting people know this is what we're doing. These are the type of complaints we're getting. These are the things that um, these are the, you know, the stats on um, whether or not they're sustained or there was no evidence um, that misconduct occurred. Being able to give them that information, that will be very important. Um, and, and I did see that you have to provide those um, in a hard copy and online, but having those easily found online is really important um, because most people will that will be the first place they go and i i will say it's a 50 50 chance when i go to an oversight entity's website whether or not i will find things easily or or they're just not there um so making sure that things are accessible and that people know what you're doing um, and I think that at the beginning, everybody's very excited about making all of these things happen. And it, it is, um, it's a lot of work. And so sustaining the, the enthusiasm for the work that needs to be done 
is also something that'll be important. So that Gary, that's one of the reasons I'm excited that you, about your your focus on kind of building um, the group, um, getting to know each other, and uh, giving people space for their voices. I think that that those type of things um, will help sustain the momentum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do with the last five minutes, and here again, Cami, thank you so much. I know if Lisa was here, um, the rest of your presentation. I'm so oh, sorry to interrupt. There was just a comment in the chat that Sasha had a question, but she wasn't able to raise her hand. She doesn't have the feature on her team. So if we have a minute, I think we just have oh, one more question. No, no. Oh, thanks, Nami. Appreciate it. Sorry, it's it's what I get for not upgrading my teams despite repeated <laughs> repeated notices to do so. Um, so thanks. Just a quick question. So what really struck me in your presentation was the um, like, so related to setting up how the public is gonna comment is that anonymity feature um, commenting without a name, which I totally get. Even just today, I called something into the non-emergency number. There was an accident near my house and a lot of like road debris. And um, and I called in the non-emergency number and they were like, and what's your name? And what's your phone number? And I was like, why well, didn't need my name and my phone number? You know, like, and it was like completely like a non-issue. So I 100% understand why somebody might have like a reservation about making a complaint um, against a law enforcement official. So my question to you is how do you preserve the anonymity um, and the ability to make a complaint without giving a name or an identifying feature while making sure that that isn't taken advantage of by the public, like uh, like in retribution, especially in sort of this, the, the kind of with the sort of like public anti-policing environment that we're seeing. Like if, if I don't know, like say somebody got a, a traffic ticket or something like that and, and, you know, emotions are high and somebody is mad and they, they make a complaint and then, and then, so how, how do you avoid situations like that where um, maybe somebody is just making a complaint just to like let off some steam or to maybe even to get back at somebody or something like that? That's a great question as well. And, and I will say, so that is often a great concern of oversight entities and ends up being not much of a problem, as, as, at least not as much as ex expected. Because you're right, when you're looking at, you know, people who get traffic tickets or just the current environment that we we find ourselves in may cause people to want to um, file complaints. Um, but we don't really see the abuse of the anonymous um, complaint process as one might think could happen. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. What is more often what oversight entities see are chronic complainers. Maybe um, members of your community with mental health issues who in their mind, these are absolutely real issues and real complaints to be made. And so, you know, I, I have someone that I work with who works at an oversight entity and I, I promise you almost 75% of the time when I'm on the phone with her, the same gentleman is coming in to make another complaint. Um, so those are more of the problems. And that's one of those things where oversight entities are always working on developing better ways of helping members of the community who are who suffer from mental health issues and how can you serve them? Because there could be absolutely some truth into the complaints that they're making. They are a vulnerable population who um, is absolutely um, able to be the victims of misconduct. And so you don't wanna disregard that, but you also have to take into consideration the possibility um, that, that why they may believe it's true, it may be in the end a false complaint. So we see things happening like that much more often. Um, also, we also find when people are making uh, false complaints, even a lot of times there's not enough information to actually investigate it. So it doesn't go anywhere. Um, they may not be able to give you the officer's name or badge number, um, but you, 
really need to assume that everyone that comes in has a, a, a valid allegation that deserves to be investigated if you have the necessary information to do so. And again, I'll say with anonymous complaints, that's often very difficult because once they've made the complaint, 